Having buried Thorin under the lonely mountain, Dane took up his abode there, and he became king under the mountain. And in time, many other dwarves gathered to his throne in the ancient halls. Of the twelve companions of Thorin, ten remained. Feely and Keeley had fallen, defending him with shield and body, for he was their mother's eldest brother. The others remained with Dane, for Dane dealt his treasure well. There was, of course, no longer any question of dividing the hoard in such shares as had been planned, to the dwarves or to Bilbo. Yet, a fourteenth share of all the silver and gold, wrought and unwrought, was given up to Bard. For Dane said, We will honour the agreement of the dead, and he has now the Arkenstone in his keeping. Even a fourteenth share was wealth exceedingly great, greater than that of many mortal kings. From that treasure, Bard sent much gold to the master of Lake Town, and he rewarded his followers and friends freely. To the elven king, he gave the emeralds of Gideon, such jewels as he most loved, which Dane had restored to him. To Bilbo, he said, This treasure is as much yours as it is mine. Though old agreements cannot stand, since so many have a claim in its winning and defence, yet, even though you were willing to lay aside all your claim, I should wish that the words of Thorin, of which he repented, should not prove true, that we should give you little. I would reward you most richly of all. Very kind of you, said Bilbo, but really it's relief to me. How on earth should I have got all that treasure home, without war and murder all along the way? I don't know. And I don't know what I should have done with it when I got home. I'm sure it's better in your hands. In the end, he would only take two small chests, one filled with silver and the other with gold, such as one strong pony could carry. That'll be quite as much as I can manage, said he. At last, the time came for him to say goodbye to his friends. Farewell, he said. May your beards never grow thin. And turning towards the mountain, he said, Farewell, Thorin Oakenshield. May your memory never fade. Then the dwarves bowed low before their gate, but words stuck in their throats. Goodbye, and good luck, wherever you fare said Balin at last. If ever you visit us again, when our halls are made fair once more, then the feast shall indeed be splendid. If ever you're passing my way, said Bilbo, don't wait to knock. Tea's at four, but any of you are welcome at any time. Then he turned away. The elf host was on the march. Gandalf and Bilbo rode behind the elven king, and beside them strode Beorn, once more in man's shape, and he laughed and sang in a loud voice upon the road. So they went on until they drew near to the borders of Mirkwood. Then they halted, for the wizard and Bilbo would not enter the wood, even though the king bade them stay a while in his halls. Farewell, O elven king, said Gandalf. Merry be the greenwood while the world is yet young, and merry be all your folk. Farewell, O Gandalf, said the king. May you ever appear where you are most needed and least expected. The oftener you appear in my halls, the better shall I be pleased. I, I, I beg of you, said Bilbo, stammering and standing on one foot, to accept this gift. And he brought out a necklace of silver and pearls the Dane had given him at their parting. In what way have I earned such a gift, O Hobbit? said the king. Well, uh, I thought, don't you know said Bilbo, rather confused, that uh, some little return should be made for your uh, the hospitality. I mean, even a burglar has his feelings. I've drunk much of your wine and eaten much of your bread. I will take your gift, O Bilbo the Magnificent, said the king gravely, and I name you Elf Friend and Blessed. May your shadow never grow less, or stealing would be too easy. Farewell. Then the elves turned towards the forest, and Bilbo started on his long road home. He had many hardships and adventures before he got back. The wild was still the wild, and there were many other things in it in those days beside goblins. But he was well guided and well guarded. The wizard was with him, and Beorn for much of the way, and he was never in great danger again. Anyway, by midwinter, Gandalf and Bilbo had come all the way back along both edges of the forest to the doors of Beorn's house, and there for a while they both stayed. 
Yuletide was warm and merry there. It was spring, and a fair one, with mild weathers and a bright sun, before Bilbo and Gandalf took their leave at last of Bayonne. And though he longed for home, Bilbo left with regret, for the flowers of the gardens of Bayonne were, in springtime, no less marvellous than in high summer. It was on May the 1st that the two came back at last to the brink of the valley of Rivendell, where stood the last, or the first, homely house. Weariness fell from Bilbo soon in that house, and he had many a merry jest and dance early and late with the elves of the valley. Yet even that place could not long delay him now, and he thought always of his own home. After a week, therefore, he said farewell to Elrond, and giving him such small gifts as he would accept, he rode away with Gandalf. At each point on the road, Bilbo recalled the happenings and the words of a year ago. It seemed to him more like ten, so that, of course, he quickly noted the place where they had turned aside for their nasty adventure with Tom and Bert and Bill. Not far from the road, they found the gold of the trolls, which they had buried, still hidden and untouched. I have enough to last me my time, said Bilbo, when they had dug it up. You had better take this, Gandalf. I dare say you can find a use for it. Indeed I can, said the wizard, but share and share alike. You may find you have more needs than you expect. As all things come to an end, even this story, a day came at last when they were in sight of the country where Bilbo had been born and bred, where the shapes of the land and of the trees were as well known to him as his hands and toes. Coming to a rise, he could see his own hill in the distance, and he stopped suddenly and said, Roads go ever, ever on, under cloud and under star, yet feet that wandering have gone turn at last to home afar. Eyes that fire and sword have seen, and horror in the halls of stone, look at last on meadows green, and trees and hills they long have known. Gandalf looked at him. My dear Bilbo, he said, something's the matter with you. You are not the hobbit that you were. And so they crossed the bridge and passed the mill by the river and came right back to Bilbo's own door. Bless me, what's going on? he cried. There was a great commotion and people of all sorts, respectable and unrespectable, were thick round the door and many were going in and out and not even wiping their feet on the mat, as Bilbo noticed with annoyance. If he was surprised, they were more surprised still. He had arrived back in the middle of an auction. There was a large notice in black and red hung on the gate, stating that on June the 22nd, Messrs. Grubb, Grubb and Burrows would sell by auction the effects of the late Bilbo Baggins, Esquire, of Bag End Underhill, Hobbiton, sale to commence at 10 o'clock sharp. It was now nearly lunchtime, and most of the things had already been sold. Bilbo's cousins, the Sackville Bagginses, were, in fact, busy measuring his rooms to see if their own furniture would fit. In short, Bilbo was presumed dead, and not everybody that said so was sorry to find the presumption wrong. The return of Mr. Bilbo Baggins created quite a disturbance, both under the hill and over the hill and across the water. It was a great deal more than a nine days' wonder. The legal bother indeed lasted for years. It was quite a long time before Mr. Baggins was in fact admitted to be alive again. The people who had got specially good bargains at the sale took a deal of convincing. And in the end, to save time, Bilbo had to buy back quite a lot of his own furniture. Many of his silver spoons mysteriously disappeared and were never accounted for. Personally, he suspected the Sackville Bagginses. On their side, they never admitted that the returned Baggins was genuine, and they were not on friendly terms with Bilbo ever after. They really had wanted to live in his nice hobbit hole so very much. Indeed, Bilbo found he'd lost more than his spoons. He had lost his reputation. It is true that forever after he remained an elf friend and had the honour of dwarves, wizards, and all such folk as ever passed that way, but he was no longer quite respectable. I'm sorry to say he did not mind. He was quite content. He took to writing poetry and visiting the elves, and though many shook their heads and touched their foreheads and said, poor old Baggins, and though few believed any of his tales, 
he remained very happy to the end of his days, and those were extraordinarily long. One autumn evening, some years afterwards, Bilbo was sitting in his study writing his memoirs. He thought of calling them There and Back Again, A Hobbit's Holiday, when there was a ring at the door. It was Gandalf and a dwarf, and the dwarf was actually Balin. Come in, come in, said Bilbo, and soon they were settled in chairs by the fire. If Balin noticed that Mr. Baggins's waistcoat was more extensive and had real gold buttons, Bilbo also noticed that Balin's beard was several inches longer and his jewelled belt was of great magnificence. They fell to talking of their times together, of course, and Bilbo asked how things were going in the lands of the mountain. It seemed they were going very well. Bard had rebuilt the town in Dale, and men had gathered to him from the lake and from south and east, and all the valley had become tilled again and rich, and the desolation was now filled with birds and blossoms in spring, and fruit and feasting in autumn. And Lake Town was refounded and was more prosperous than ever, and much wealth went up and down the running river, and there was friendship in those parts between elves and dwarves and men. The old master had come to a bad end. Bard had given him much gold for the help of the lake people, but being the kind that easily catches such a disease, he fell under the dragon sickness and took most of the gold and fled with it and died of starvation in the waste, deserted by his companions. The new master's of a wiser kind, said Balin, and very popular, for of course he gets most of the credit for the present prosperity. They're making songs which say that in his day the rivers run with gold. Then the prophecies of the old songs have turned out to be true after a fashion, said Bilbo. Of course, said Gandalf, and why should not they prove true? Surely you don't disbelieve the prophecies because you had a hand in bringing them about yourself. You don't really suppose, do you, that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck, just for your sole benefit? You are a very fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I'm very fond of you, but you're only quite a little fellow in a wide world, after all. Thank goodness, said Bilbo, laughing, and handed him the tobacco jar. That was the last part of The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. Abridged for radio in 15 parts by Brian Sibley and read by Sir Michael Horden. The producer was Dickon Reed. <laughs>